and I'm hanging out with my 15 year old and we're going on a date. Um, and she's buying clothes that I don't approve of. <laughs> <laughs> she's not saying, dad, tell me what impact these clothes are going to have on my life. Mm. I mean, she wants me to shut my mouth and let her use the gift card that I bought her. Go good fathers. Today I have an amazing guest with me, Andrew Anderson. We were just talking off air about so many different things about showing up big for you. And just to jump in, because I know you guys like to start real quick. I have a quote that we were discussing, which is what we resist, we persist. And what we leave into, we learn from. Andrew, brother, what does this mean to you? Well, man, when it comes to uh, challenges in our lives, it's easy to meet them with resistance. And when we resist things, they just persist. They stick around. They don't go away. And yet what we can lean into and give attention, time, energy, and effort, we end up learning from. And then those challenges are no longer persisting in our lives. And as a father... I have learned that lesson probably more than any other area of my life. Catch the feel good fatherhood listeners up on when you say that, what is your experience as a father? What's your family situation? So we can have some context about what that means. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a unique person in that um, I have children with two women, uh, never married to both of them at the same time. So uh, I live in Idaho, not Utah. So I don't have two wives at once, but I, uh, was married uh, for seven years and we had three beautiful daughters together. Mm -hmm. And I went through my dark night of the soul called divorce. And then I was blessed to uh, get wife number two, who's my favorite. And we've now been married for over seven years and she brought two kids into the picture. So we had five, she was 26 years old and I was 30 with five children. And we said, we're good. And then uh, we thought, you know, with God's inspiration that one more would help bring the families together. And then someone said, that kid's always going to feel different. So he's got to have a sibling. So when you do all that, it adds up to seven kids. <laughs> that is, that is so great because you've run uh, on the show. We talk a lot about the different stages of father, different kind of fathers. Co Co-parenting yeah. is a thing. Uh, recommitting to your wife, like to your new wife, that's a thing. Having the kids, you know, basically that Mick household, absolutely love it. Uh, I can't wait to jump in. So one of the pieces that's really important to you in your journey is going from a teacher to a coach, to a breakthrough coach. Can you talk yeah. about that and talk about the application of that to fatherhood? Definitely. I, I was living a dream life. We had these two beautiful girls. We were pregnant with number three. I was teaching, finishing my master's degree, and I did something very specific in that I got to teach religious education to teenagers that were in high school, and they got to come step aside from the high school for an hour each day and study scripture and apply it to their lives. And I was loving it. Like that energy and being with those kids and seeing them transform their lives was incredible. And I thought that I was going to do that forever. And I never thought that I was going to be going through a divorce, moving states and changing careers all at the same time. And that's what happened when uh, we weren't able to work out all of our differences. And she ultimately on Easter day handed me those divorce papers and said that she was done. Oh, goodness. So that's the, that's the beginning of the story. Got it. So you transitioned to breakthrough coach. So yep. walk us through, I think a timeline would be a good point of reference for the feel good fathers. If sure. we can super fact you like this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, because mm -hmm. as we roll in your lessons, it'll allow us to kind of understand, okay, this is the situation. Here's where I learned this situation. Here's where I learned. So what's that factual yeah. timeline that you feel comfortable good. sharing? Yeah. So August of 2013, it'll be 10 years. I finished my master's degree, we move states, we have baby number three, and I am transferred to a new high school. So all of these things happen. And then a month later, September 2013, she says that she thinks we it would be a good idea to separate. Mm 
I move into my parents' basement where we spend the next six to seven months up until Easter of 2014, where she hands me those divorce papers. During that time of separation, I went into real estate. Um, the nature of the teaching position is that if you're going through a separation or divorce, you know, if you're like super sleazy and having an affair or you're addicted to something, they don't want you in the classroom working with those teenagers teaching you know, those yeah. gospel principles. So yeah. I was working at the time and in my teaching career and I went into real estate and real estate was one of the worst, best things that ever happened for me because I found coaching and self-development and I was introduced to this, this field. So that's the timeline. We can keep going unless there's any other questions or anything you would love for me to share about that with our listeners. I, I'm curious about the connection of your book, uh, to strengthen the oak, strength of the willow, and what like how let's let's connect the dots. Like this is fascinating. You go on a journey of personal development. You start developing. You're saying coaching, which for the Silver Fathers that aren't aware. What that means is that somebody is putting in front of you the things that you need to work on. And that could be soft, different kind of disciplines. Um, mm -hmm. Well, actually, we could have you kind of define what that means for you. And then you've got this book that's come out that has this whole, uh, I mean, so many topics in it. It's a great read. Talk to us about coaching. Talk to us about what it meant to you. And then let's tie it all together with the, with the book. Coaching is all things teaching, consulting, leadership, friendship, ministry, all packaged into what I believe is one of the greatest deliverables for transforming someone's life, whether it's their career, their marriage, their family, their fitness, or their spirituality. So whereas a teacher is going to say, I'm going to present something to you that you've never known before and show you, or a consultant says, I'm going to tell you how to change and and you know essentially prescribe something or a mentor will say i'm going to be here and tell you everything i've learned and hopefully you can take something away a coach takes all those and says i'm going to ask you the questions that will help you self-discover what it is that needs to be different and help you come to the answers so that you get to own 100 percent this process so if we lose it's the client's fault. And if we win, it's the client that becomes the all-star MVP and gets the bonus. If we, if we don't win, then uh, the coach usually gets fired in a sports setting and then the, the, rather than the uh, quarterback or the point guard or whoever it might be. So coaching is truly about helping the individual see things they've never been able to see and come to solutions that they've never had. Is that related to my follow-up question here about what makes a coach good versus what makes a coach great? Yes. <laughs> um, there are things that I have learned in coaching in the last, you know, nine years that I've been doing it uh, that I can see because I get to coach coaches now. And the, the good to great is the ability to ask the questions and go to the places that no one else will go so that the person can discover something that they've never been able to discover before. What kind of, let's think, of, let's think about it in the context of fatherhood, right? So when I hear that, what I'm hearing is that the coach has a different view. The coach is usually somebody, uh, another analogy would be somebody's in the trenches versus somebody else that has the 30,000 foot view, right. right? So the coach can see what's going to be in front of you. They can sort of imagine a little bit where you're going, maybe plot a course about how, how you're going to navigate through something. They have an idea through the questions of, all right, through that relationship, what is the answer that I'm going to get from, from this kind of question and kind of steering towards what we hope is a desirable result because you don't hire a tennis coach if you're trying to throw a football well. So exactly. the coach is trying to help you create a result. But now let's think about this in the context of fatherhood because in one definition, and I firmly believe this, a great coach is a great father. And a big piece of being a father is coaching and helping and developing your kids, helping them thrive. What's your perspective on that? One of the great challenges between fatherhood and coaching is that my clients pay me <laughs> and they want it. And my kids and my wife will sometimes say, I don't need a coach right now. 
Yeah. And, and that's the difference. And we cannot coach someone unless they ask for it. And I'm learning as a father that no matter how good my intentions are, no matter how skilled I am or how badly I want this for them, if my children are not coming to me or I'm not knocking and they're opening the door, then I don't get to coach them. What they sometimes just need is a friend or someone to listen. And I, I know this isn't probably where you thought the question was going, but I don't coach as much in my home as I would like to, or people would think I do. And that, I, I think that's completely reasonable. I think of when you have the, it's, it's kind of the issue of those of us that are really into personal development, that yeah. we're all into growth, we're all into contribution. And sometimes, and I've heard this in the context of a spousal relationship, yeah. that we always want our spouse to do, think, believe, see, understand the same things in yes. a cream. Um, the way that I've understood this and I've been coached through this is that different people in your life have a different role and the, right. and the role of your spouse and the role of your kids is not necessarily that of a peer or of a coaching or a client or as a mentor, it's a different functional relationship. That's yeah. my perspective. How, how are you navigating those relationships? Well, it, it's tricky because my oldest is 15 and my youngest is 15 weeks. And uh, when I'm hanging out with my 15 year old and we're going on a date, then um, she's buying clothes that I don't approve of. <laughs> she's not saying, dad, tell me what impact these clothes are going to have on my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, she wants me to shut my mouth and let her use the gift card that I bought her. Right. And, and that's, that's a challenge uh, because she's 15 now. And if I push back, like I do to a client, she won't ever want to go on a date again. If I push back on a client, they have asked for it and they recognize that my candor, my being very direct and honest with them is because I care so much. If I'm that candid with my daughter, well, first of all, she doesn't have the brain capacity or the life experience to recognize how much I care. And she just thinks I'm controlling. I think that's, I think that's a lovely insight for the feel good father to really kind of reflect on in particular, I think the teenage years. And when I've heard from a handful of different uh, fathers on the show yeah. is that in a certain age, and I think we intuitively understand this, but sometimes we just need to hear it out loud that when our children reach a certain age, they're figuring out for themselves who they are. And we've right. already been pouring into them our morals, our values, our belief systems, our worldview, the way that we see them. And hopefully we communicated the love and the direction and the both nurture and sternness that comes from, from fatherhood. And at that stage, I think, what I'm hearing is you're saying she just kind of wants to end because she's figuring out who she is. And we, yeah. at that point, that's that transition, I think, for fathers from their children to adults, where we go from, we still maintain disciplinary and we still maintain the parent, but we mm -hmm. want more into advisor. Yeah. And, and here's a great way to look at this. I am the youngest of five children. And I have nieces and nephews that are in their 20s and they're getting married and they're having children. And because I'm the youngest uncle and they're the oldest grandchild, they're more like a, like a sibling. And mm. we have really great, deep relationships. In fact, they've asked me to coach them. I've done deep breakthrough sessions with them. I've done mental and emotional release therapy with them and they've asked for it. And so what I'm starting to learn now with my teenage daughters, because I have two and a half, she'll be 13 in August, what I'm learning is that if I can treat them like I do my nieces and when, when my nieces come to my home and they've got the crop top and I can see their belly, I don't say anything to them. <laughs> right. And, and they know, they know where I stand on that. And so do my daughters. And so I'm trying to like, this is hard. I'm trying to treat my teenage daughters like I do my nieces because 
now my nieces that are in their 20s and they're having babies and getting married, they're coming to me. And that's mm -hmm. what I want for my daughters. Even though they may not come to me for advice and, and right now, I want them to into, into their adulthood. And so I'm trying to show up for my daughters and my, you know, my, my teenage children like I would you know, the next door neighbor's kids. Like, yeah, my next door neighbor's cool. Like, I, yeah, if I needed something, I could talk to him. So that's, I, that's my, my current learning that I've been going through the last couple months. I love the intention because what you're communicating is I want to have a relationship with my kids as they're becoming adults. Yeah. And I like, that's so fantastic because I think if well, if you're listening here, Phil, good father, we know that that's what you want. Right. And so I think we've got to, we all have to figure out, you know, my eldest is 11 now. So I'm starting to navigate entering that space. So I'm learning everything I can from that's like you, Andrew, and other, and other folks about how they've navigated these teenage years. Cause I have the same goal. I'd like to right. slot myself into that friend, trusted advisor as they become adults and, and see and discover who they become and the choices that they make. Yep. You mentioned, and you know, the, Jay, the, the analogy, the analogy of the strength of the oak and the strength of the willow here really is a beautiful one. We need oak like commitment and strength when it comes to values and principles and things that we will not bend on. Right. If my daughter uh, brings home a, a crack pipe, I'm not going to be like, well, I mean, if my niece brought a crack bike, I'm going to say something. I'm a hundred percent committed to the level 10 things that are important, hmm. right? Alcohol in a vehicle, right? I don't want her to drink alcohol ever. And yet if it's in a vehicle, I'm surely going to say something. If it's hiding in her closet, I may wait for a while. And so there are oak like things that are non-negotiables and everything else needs that willow like strength that grace and flexibility that allows the relationship to bend and not break. I absolutely love this. What are some examples that fathers might think are oak, but are actually willow in your experience? Yeah. Well, let's say, uh, having a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Sure. Um, like trying trying to con control something like that, right? Or grades, like my child, one hundred percent has to be a straight A student. Like, really? Like, what do you really? I mean, what's the purpose of education? Okay, so mm -hmm. we we sometimes get so stuck in a letter of the law way that we think things should be, like the Sadducees and Pharisees in Jesus' time, that we forget the purpose, the spirit of the law. Like, I want them to love learning. And find something they can passionately pursue mm. throughout their life. And if I get hung up on the grades, they're going to hate the learning process. They're going to hate their teachers and they're going to hate me. What do you, in your estimation, using both your coaching experience and your experience as a father, can you do to help instill the love of the journey and process over the pursuit of the accolades and the results? Well, this is why, <laughs> this is why the current generation, it's the COVID generation, these young adults, they're struggling so much and it's not the teacher's fault. It's not the coaches, the sports coaches and the music and the dance and the theater. It's the parents' fault. It's because parents are not able to let go of the outcomes. They can't. And I see this over and over and over again. They are so tied to this end result of X, Y, Z label or accolade that they forget who they're becoming along the way. And so if you want your child to be able to do that, you have to hold yourself extremely accountable to do so as well. This sounds, and it, you brought up the Christian context. This sounds a lot like Galatians. This sounds a lot like it's not about what you're doing. It's about what's been done for you and just like hanging out and everything you're doing is because of what's been done. Everything you're doing, it's already happened in the past. It's about now living the process, staying in the present, not hanging out in the past, not hanging out in the future, just doing the right thing right now. Would that be That's an accurate right. summation? Definitely. And, and, and children, teens, even young adults, they don't have, again, their brains are not fully developed. They don't have enough life experience 
to be able to fully ground themselves in the present. They're still thinking about the past and the future. And as adults, we have to no longer, as Paul said, right? When I was a child, I thought as a child, like, like we have to move beyond and get past childish things. Like we have to be the bigger person. We have to be conscious enough to recognize that nothing truly matters beyond how I'm showing up in a state of love right now. And I do not pretend to have this figured out. If you were to see what happens in my household, you'll be like, Andrew, your audio and video don't match. I'm like, of course they don't. I understand perfect principles. I coach them and I am learning to live them just like you are. It's, I think in that world, we're all, the pursuit is not in perfection. That is a recipe for misery. There's, mm -hmm. there's no, there is no book. There's no person. There's no verse in the Bible that says, Hey, you can be ideal and perfect and you can be aiming for that. It's more like you should be walking along with the principles. You should be walking along and enjoying the process. You should be executing admirably every step of the way. So I completely understand that. And as, as feeling good fathers, you know, this wherever you're at, as long as you're doing your best, that's good. Keep going, keep doing your best, keep applying yourself. That's what we're talking about. I'd like to move into another major theme of the book. And I know a major theme for you, and this is this concept of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And so I think when I think of the concept of gratitude, I think of the counterpoint being narcissism. And one thing that when we're talking about kids that we need to understand is that they are narcissistic by nature and they have to have <laughs> a like survival beam and we don't blame them for that. And we, and it is a bit childish behavior. But how in, in your teaching, how do you see instilling a deep sense of gratitude into your kids? The other fathers are dying to know. I once heard someone say, how do you, when I was teaching scripture, they, a teacher said, how do you get a student to fall in love with, with the scriptures? And he said this, I'll never forget. It was so profound. He said, you fall in love with the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I share this poem that my dad quoted all the time growing up. He said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely show the way. The eye is a greater pu pupil, far more willing than the ear. While find counsels oft confusing, examples always clear. That poem goes on. It's by Edgar Guest. You can find it in my book or find it online. And what my dad taught me through that poem and through his life was that our examples, living in a state of gratitude, I can tell my kids all day long to tell their mom thanks for dinner. But this morning when I'm on the mountain bike and I wake my daughter up at 6, 10 in the morning to come lay down on the couch to be with the dog, because usually I'm doing that because if we're not there, he's barking and waking everyone up. I wake her up, right? I put the blanket on her. She's laying down so that mom and the baby don't wake up because the dog's barking because dad's out mountain biking. I come home. The first thing I say to her is, thank you. Thanks for letting me go mountain biking and helping with the dog this morning. What's going to be more impressional for her? that gratitude and giving her a hug and a kiss on the top of the head or saying, who's grateful for dinner? Please tell mom you're grateful. <laughs> Here, per perform this script so that everybody knows that you love them. Tell, tell so-and-so, thank you. Thank you. I, oh, I just, I you, you want, you want, you, you want to have grateful children. Write thank you notes and let your kids put the stamp and put them in the mailbox. Right. Be a grateful person. Your this children, been, yeah, they'll, they'll be so as well. This has been such a huge unlock for me because my daughter gets a lot of compliments on, uh, like she's got very fair skin and freckles yeah. and she's got gorgeous red hair. Yeah, uh, like locks and, and, and weaves stuff like that. And she's not yet able to kind of process what she, she'll get. She gets compliments all the time. And so for her, it's like this rote, consistent behavior. And I, I'm kind of curious, like even in this situation, because whenever somebody out 
out in the world said something, I'm just kind of like, just say thank you, you know, so just say yeah. thank you, just practice saying thank you. And I'm kind of curious, it's kind of like, how, how can I instill this in her? Because when I say, hey, because I know when I say, hey, daughter, you should say thank you. What I'm actually saying is these other people are pouring into you. And you should not be grateful for what they're saying because then you're getting attached to that external validation, but more just the fact that people are acknowledging you for something. And it could be, and for right now, it's going to be, and uniquely because you're the young woman, it's going to be, well, she's the young girl, yeah. right? It's going to be about her hair or her looks or her style or something like that. I'm kind of curious, like, what would you suggest me or feel good fathers like me to do in this situation to help her kind of see that people in the world, they, they mean well, they're communicating the best that they can, even if they're not pointed right. in the direction you want, or even if you've heard that message a hundred times, because if you're young, attractive women, you get people telling you all the time that you're attractive. I think as a father and daughters, I feel like that's something that we should help them navigate. Right. Yeah. So what would you suggest? So in that moment, you're present and you're observing this, right? You're a participant. So yes. I, yeah. So if, if I'm in that situation, ideally, I think I would say this, I would say, you know what, Joe, whoever it is, uh, probably it's not Joe, hopefully it's a woman. Cause if it's a man complimenting your 11 year old daughter on her looks, then, I mean, that's tricky, but, but you can say, a, you know, that's George, never happened that for one thing that's never happened. And, um, and they usually, if they start, you'll get a look. It's, right. Okay. So we'll call her Josephine, like this woman. Uh, so you say, you know what, Josephine, something I love about you is you always know how to make people feel good. Mm -hmm. You're awesome. Okay. Or, or, and you don't even have to say thank you. Cause you're just showing your daughter your ability to appreciate that quality in that other person. And then again, your daughter, it's not about the thank you. It's not the script. It's you're seeing something in them and then she will see it too because she saw you acknowledge that in that person. Okay. Great unlock level up. I just had my little super Mario moment. I ate a mushroom. It's great. I love it. I love it. I love it. Another concept you're super fond of talking about is idea of emotional real estate. For the show of good fathers, what's emotional real estate? I, I've never heard the term before. Can you walk us through what this means? Yes, absolutely. So we all have space that we own. My body is my space. This is my temple. No one gets to enter it unless they have met the qualifications to come, right? Like, uh, this is my temple. Right? This is my real estate. No one gets to make any decisions about it. I am the only person that gets to decide what happens to my body. Okay. Um, we allow other people to foreclose on or short sale our emotional real estate, our thoughts, feelings, our spirit, our soul. And we let people come and go without paying rent or being qualified as a buyer or having any you know, uh, reason to be there. And then we mm -hmm. prostitute out our, our emotions and then we pretend like it's somehow either their fault or all our fault. We're either victimized or we are you know, playing that, that blame game. And so taking a 100% ownership of our emotions and only allowing certain people in that we believe are qualified to, you know, serve us in that way is what I mean by emotional real estate. What would you say would be an example where either you or a client has successfully navigated this concept in as a father or in a father in context? Sure. So let's take the, 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 the uh, 67 year old father who's in my office yesterday, whose daughter has just come out of rehab. She's 30 some years old and she has children of her own. And this father goes to the home and there are new rules in place. 
about how this father is and is not supposed to be interacting with his grandkids and with her because uh, she has been triggered by him. And he's saying, how in the world am I now a trigger? Whereas before we were best friends and we were in, we, we worked together as business partners. Yes. And so you can recognize that this was a highly triggering event for him, that his daughter is now triggered coming out of rehab and he's trying to navigate these new waters. And so I didn't say to him, hey, you know what your problem is, pal, is you're letting her walk all over you emotionally and you need to stop taking things personally. That's what a mentor or a consultant might do. <laughs> so my job is to listen, hold space for him and ask him questions to help him self-discover what I think I might know about this situation. And, and what he eventually came to is he said, oh my gosh, I'm totally making this all about me, aren't I? And then I say, when did you decide to allow her to have ownership with your feelings? And, and I love that question. When I can drop that question on a client because we have gotten to that point, when did you decide to give someone else permission to determine how you feel? That is a perfect example. And he said, I need to give her space. And I need to stop entering her emotional real estate and I need to not make this about me and I need to let her heal and I need to just do what I do best. And I, he then said, and stop taking things so personally. <laughs> I, I love this. And I think, I think the only thing that I would add here in my limited context here would be it is completely acceptable for you as that person, Does it, mom, dad, whoever it is that's listening. I feel like it's completely acceptable for you to acknowledge the fact that a situation may around some sort of feeling in you. Yeah. And that acknowledging and being aware that this is a feeling. And I think if I'm going to rephrase back to you, but they're the response that we do own. And so the yes. emotion can occur. We should accept that, understand it, allow it to flow See through us. Kind of yep. fall. In, in, in yep. your context, as the willow. But then understand that where we are, the oak, where we are committed is in how we respond to that situation and decisions that we make about that reality. Beautifully put. If we don't acknowledge the emotion, then we come across as inconsiderate. So, yes. and that's a tricky thing as a coach is, or even as a father for that matter, is acknowledging the emotion without making it right or wrong. Because some people are so good at being empathetic that they're actually yes. empowering an emotion that's not serving this person. And you just, we just want to in that situation. That's right. We just want to acknowledge it and recognize it. And then to whatever degree that we can help them reframe it so that they can choose a different response. At the time of this recording, Spider-Man across the, the multi, uh, the Spider-Verse has come out. So it's the second in the Spider-Man movies. And I, I love the can, I love the, the Marvel. I love that kind of the stories that we tell in that way. But in the first movie, that, this reminds me of that time when the father, like Miles Morales is becoming a young man. He's becoming Spider-Man. He's becoming his version. And there's a beautiful sequence where the father is, I mean, getting choked up. Where the father is like, I know you're going through a lot, but I'm just here for you. And I still believe in you. And then that's when he like breaks out because he's like, she's bound, he's tied up because the other spider people have like said, hey, you're not quite ready. You're not quite mature. You haven't yeah. admitted. You have committed to this next stage yet to take on what it takes to be Spider-Man, which is uh -huh. a, it's a great coming of age. And it, and it takes the father saying, you're not leaning on me, but it's okay. And I'm okay with it. And you need, I know you need to go out there and be you. It's a wonderful scene. It's a wonderful sequence. And this whole conversation really reminds me of that to just kind of nail it and like, Hey, if you need to, as a father, if, if this conversation isn't doing it for you and you need to go watch the movie to understand sort of the emotional journey of what this can look like. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the Miles Brown of Spider-Man that I think would be a fantastic movie for you to kind of pop in, watch with your kids. You just kind of understand the lesson through experiencing it in, in medium. So you want to hear my favorite superhero fatherhood scene of all times? 
Yes, yes. This is actually like my favorite movie and it's my favorite like scene of a movie. It's Batman Begins. Oh, it came yes. out in like 2005, I think, 2006. Yes. And uh, little Bruce Wayne is running with his childhood friend that's a girl and he falls right into this well. And it's yes. this old dried up well and he ends up in the bottom of this deep, deep well. And this is his first experience being around and ex having fear with bats because all these bats are swarming around him and, and then the scene goes black. And then the next thing that you see is his father, right? The doctor who has repelled down and reaches down and pulls him up and carries him back to the house with Alfred walking next to him. And while he's carrying his son, he asks this question. He says, why do we learn, learn to fall, Bruce? So we can learn to pick ourselves back up. And as a father, sometimes we're doing the picking up and sometimes we're allowing them to learn how to pick themselves up. And whichever one it is, we're there, we're present. In, in Absolutely. It's all Absolutely love it. And a Fantastic. Absolutely. Top 10 father and see I think anywhere. hundred yeah. percent. So good. You've got some really interesting experience, seven kids, lots of different kinds of needs when it comes to being a father with different children, different personalities, different influences, that kind of jazz. What other elements would you take to other fathers that are sort of navigating and struggling to understand what their children need or even what their spousal needs, what would you bring in that help them either understand or help them contextualize what's going on? Um, yeah, that's the question. Yeah. One of my all time favorite quotes about fatherhood comes from M. Russell Ballard. And he said, the greatest thing that a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that work when you're divorced? <laughs> right. Well, this is where the the Christian, you know, teaching of you know loving your enemy and praying for them. Mm -hmm. It's one of the, the most challenging things that I can do. Loving mm -hmm. the mother of my three daughters who did not want to be married to me anymore and who, you know, to this day, it's she is to some degree, you know, an enemy. Now, here's one of my most proud fatherhood moments. We're sitting in a counseling session and my daughter is asked, how do your parents do with co-parenting? She said, oh, they're amazing. And I'm like looking at the counselor and she's looking at me and I, and the counselor said, yeah, but what could they do better? And my daughter says nothing. And like, the counselors, you know, continuing to, to, to ask further questions like, yeah, but you know, like, couldn't they? And she said, you know, I've watched different parents in these situations treat each other in, in certain ways. And I think my parents are great. And I'm just like dying because I know the emails and the text messages and the conversations in the background. And, and, and yet she knows that I don't, agree with her mom. She knows that we parent in very different ways. And yet I'm doing everything I possibly can to love her to the greatest ability that is possible for me. And so whether it's a divorced mother or the current mother of your children, loving them and teaching them how important that individual is who gave them life is the greatest thing a father can do for his children. If you're, when you're listening to this feel good father is there's another interview, the Chris Felton interview, I'll put the link down below that talks a lot about this similar concept, uh, for further exploration into how do you, after a divorce, how do you continue to forgive, bring gratitude for that role? And it was a, the same lovely expression. The theme exists of gratitude for the mom, regardless of what's going on. So that's, that is something, uh, the other bo uh, book that I think of the top of this in the Bible is I think it's first Peter, not about the man, 
the husband is responsible for bringing the love into the home. And that can be in co-parenting, that can be in original marriage, original parents, whatever kind of context it happens to be. So as a, as the father, as the husband, we are responsible for that love. And so that's something that we can take on. Personal as a coach, as a father, right? Personal growth, huge to you. What are some specific practices that you would recommend to fathers who are struggling to balance personal growth and responsibilities of the parent? So the Aesop fable that I share in the book is the goose and the golden egg. And the man has the goose who lays the golden egg. And each day he takes the golden egg down to the market and exchanges it for valuable goods or money. And he uh, is in love with his golden goose. And one day he gets impatient and he knows that he could get more than one egg a day because all those eggs keep coming. So they must all be in there. And he kills the goose to pull out all of the eggs. And when it comes to fatherhood, whether you believe it or not, you are the golden goose mm -hmm. and you are here to serve and love and teach and preside and provide and protect your family. And if you are not walking in the door or getting out of bed as the golden goose, having taken care of yourself spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, then you're cheating on your family. And I had this realization and it changed everything in my life. And I write about creating a personal plan, a GPS for you, so that when you step into that work boat or you step into that husband boat or father boat or whatever boat you're asked to be in, you can be in full swing. And it's what's called swing state, this beautiful place where you are in rhythm and you're at your best. So as selfish as it may seem, you got to lead you first. Andrew, if folks want to learn more about this topic, learn more about you, where should they go to sign out? Where should they go? There's this new online store called Amazon and you put in the search bar, amazon.com, put in the search bar, strength of the oak, strength of the willow. My book can be found there. You can also go to my website, andrewlanderson.com or follow me on social media. I'm there every day sharing messages. Um, Andrew L. Anderson, 85. Andrew Anderson, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. If you liked what we got to experience today, just subscribe up here and thank you for being with us. And feel good fathers. Thanks for uh, tuning in. You know what the deal is. This video right here, this is what YouTube has decided is the next one. It's a great video. Probably one of mine. Sure hope it is. It's going to give you some great context. Thanks for tuning in.